For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. The fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the city's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. My name is Edith Jessie Thompson. I live at 41 Kensington Gardens, Ilford. Your age? 28. Are you married? Yes. What is your husband's name? Percy Thompson. Oh. How would you describe your relationship with Mr. Thompson? Affectionate. And has that always been the case? Yes. Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters. In the Roaring Twenties, everybody knew their names. But while their notoriety might have faded, the murder case they were involved in leaves us fascinated and appalled almost a century later. It was a murder that scandalized Britain. A heady mixture of sex, violence, and forbidden love that led to three deaths and an innocent person being sent to the gallows. November 1918, the end of the First World War. Thousands of Londoners took to the streets in celebration. The conflict had killed a million Britons and fractured pre-war society. Men had gone to battle and women to work, both in unprecedented numbers. The UK itself had experienced bombing raids from Zeppelin airships, which were soon labeled baby killers. London had also been rocked in 1917 by the Silvertown explosion in the East End. A munitions factory that was providing explosives for use in the war caught fire. 50 tons of TNT ignited, leading to 73 deaths and over 400 injuries. The blast could be heard right across the capital. In the final year of World War I, the Spanish flu pandemic had infected more than half a billion people worldwide. Even the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, had been struck down by the disease. It was no wonder that the country was delighted to see the carnage finally coming to an end. The Roaring Twenties couldn't come quickly enough. There was a lot of anxiety that socialism, even communism, might hit Britain. There was the unrest in Ireland. You'd had the Easter Rising. You'd also got protests going on in Egypt and India. So there were a lot of anxieties at governmental level about what could happen. Some of the attitudes were changing in relation to women in particular, because before the First World War, there'd been the suffragettes, and then women did men's jobs. And after the war, then there started to become a time when women were generally getting more freedoms. One of the most important social changes of the time was that women over 30 were given the vote. There was also a great sense of relief that people had actually survived the war, so there was a sense of wanting, wanting enjoyment. So this is when we get the dances, the Charleston, the Foxtrot, and you get the Flapper Girls. <laughs> Flapper really referred to a young woman who didn't have the vote, so a woman under 30, who represented modernity, the future, all that was new, mobility in every kind of sense. She was someone who wore 
androgynous kind of clothes. So on the one hand, she represents the future and all that's exciting about the future, but she's also seen as possibly quite immoral, uh, suspect. So there's anxiety about the flappers. Women were starting to drive cars, smoke cigarettes, wear short skirts. They were becoming more liberated. It was one of the things that was happening that people were slowly getting used to. One woman who was fully embracing this new world was Edith Jessie Thompson. She was 24 when the armistice was declared and was doing very well in post-war Britain. But soon, the whole country would know her name for all the wrong reasons. Edith Thompson was a young woman who'd done very well for herself. She came from a low middle class background. She grew up first in Dalston, then Manor Park. Her father was a clerk. And she was very clever, sharp and attractive. And she got work in a wholesale milliner's called Carlton and Pryor. And she had a meteoric rise through the war. And she was very efficient, very good at her job. And she was one of the manageresses. So she did enormously well. Edith was the eldest of five siblings and had been a lively tomboy in her youth, sociable and popular. Percy Thompson was a few years older than Edith and, like her, commuted regularly into the city for work. Percy was well turned out, earnest and good-natured. By Christmas 1909, the teenagers were an item. Edith and Percy shared a love for theatre and music hall, but whereas Edith had a particular love and talent for dancing, Percy was unadventurous. They courted for about six years. I mean, she met him when she wasn't yet 16, and he was, he was 19. And then they finally married in January 1916, uh, when she was just 22. When she married him, a lot of young men were going to war, a lot of young men were being killed. And so, although she sort of fended him off, for a time. Eventually, she agreed to marry him. He never was called up because he was deemed unfit to serve. He possibly pretended that he had this heart complaint. He was obviously quite a cowardly man. Goodness knows why she was with him, because she was immensely attractive, life and soul of the party, and probably could have had any young man. Edith was shrewd and enjoyed male and female company. Her husband, by contrast, was stolid and unimaginative, even morose at times. Edith never settled into traditional married life. She did not have children, nor did she give up the job at Carlton and Pryor, where she continued to earn more than her husband. She smoked, bet on horses, and read romance novels and thrillers voraciously. She was a thoroughly modern woman. Edith's childhood dreams of great love were suffocated by humdrum reality. Despite her burgeoning career as buyer and bookkeeper for Carlton and Pryor milliners, Edith was restless. And as a result, her already strained relationship with her husband, Percy, was in irrevocable decline. Before long, though, Edith was to be reacquainted with an old friend, someone who would completely change her life forever, someone with whom she would begin a passionate love affair. The secret correspondence between the two showed the intensity of their attraction, but that attraction would have disastrous consequences 
and Edith's vivid imagination and her writings would come back to haunt her. Help! Edith Thompson was a successful career woman at the beginning of the Roaring Twenties. Her life might have seemed idyllic from the outside, but she was stuck in an unhappy marriage with her husband, Percy. They were growing ever further apart. At the end of a working week in late May 1920, Edith visited her father and mother in Manor Park, just as she did every other Friday evening. This time, however, when she knocked on the door, an unexpected but familiar lodger was there to greet her. Hello, Edith. Ready. How are you grown? Can I take it back? Oh. <laughs> Edith had known Freddie Bywater as much of his life. He was the mischievous school friend of her younger brothers. And in May 1920, now nearly 18, he was lodging temporarily with Edith's parents and he was no longer a little boy. By this time, he was a merchant sailor and his ship would dock at East India Docks. And so Freddie went round to her parents to say, could I lodge in your place? And every Friday, um, Edith would, would go and have supper with them. And so she met him. And I think there was, from all accounts, an immediate attraction. The attraction seems to have been there right from the beginning. She was clearly dissatisfied with her husband, who by this time, sort of the end of the working day, was retreating from the bedroom with a bottle of whiskey. So Edith inevitably started sort of looking for consolation. And there he was this young lad, 18 years old, and he offered her the consolation that she wanted. The handsome Freddie was very different to her husband. The hypochondriac Percy had avoided service in the First World War with a minor, perhaps, manufactured medical complaint. He certainly boasted of his cowardly actions afterwards. By contrast, Freddie ran away from home when he was only 15 to join the Merchant Navy and sail the world, where he suffered the very real threat of German U-boats. He saw exotic, far-flung lands that Edith could only dream about or read about in her books. He was physically fit. He loved football and boxing. The attraction was electric, instantaneous. It jolted Edith from her routine life and consumed her utterly. For months afterwards, they secretly exchanged flirtatious messages. It was thrillingly erotic but for now, harmless. In the summer of 1921, Edith and Percy went on holiday to the Isle of Wight. Edith's sister, Avis, and Freddie joined them. At the time, there was hope from her parents that Freddie was interested in Avis, and Avis was certainly interested in Freddie. And I think no one realized that there was this attraction going on between Edith and Freddie, but nothing had happened as such. But in the Isle of Wight, they managed to get time together and they had their first kiss and they declared love for each other. So that was really the start of what became an incredibly passionate affair. On their return, Edith encouraged Percy to take in Freddie as a lodger. He agreed. Taking lodgers was quite a common practice. It made sense for Frederick to move into the house so it wouldn't have been uncommon for him to take accommodation as part of his wages. Percy initially really got on with Freddie um, and had no inkling of something between his wife. So Freddie stayed there for about three months. Then things got difficult. Percy was becoming suspicious, though. In the enclosed, stuffy interiors of the house, tempers broiled. It's 
It's getting cold. She'll be here. It's nearly half past. You said four. We'll just wait a little while longer. Can you do that? I don't mind. Fine. We'll all have cold tea then. Percy. No, no. Mustn't bother little Avis. Leave her out of it. Always bowing and scraping to your family. She's my sister. Yes, and I'm your husband. And this is my house. Your house? And who paid for it? <sighs> Some man you are. <laughs> hey! Do not speak to me like that. Lay off her. You keep out of it. Are you right? I said keep out of it. If you ever touch her like that again, you will have me to do with. I want you out of my house. In the weeks after Freddy's departure from the house, he and Edith continued their affair, but this time outside the home. Percy suspected, but could prove nothing. And then, on the 9th of September, 1921, Freddy went back to sea. Edith's only lifeline to him was the letters she wrote. Frederick went to sea, so he'd be away for six-week intervals. And Edith would write these letters almost on a daily basis. There would be points when she'd say, do you remember that first kiss on the bus at Shanklin? Um, and so all her letters survived, and it kind of chronicled the affair. Edith was the most extraordinary letter writer, nearly 70, which were found in a box. She wrote mainly, actually, sort of literary criticism of the books that they both read. She would do this incredibly sophisticated analysis of the, the characters in this book, but she weighs up the morality of these people. She was a prodigious writer with a vivid imagination. She confided everything to him, from critiques of the latest books she was reading to timings of her period, from erotic fantasies to her daily routine. Elsewhere, she wrote ridiculous fantasies about murdering her husband by sticking shards of glass in his porridge. She was sending cuttings about murders that were being committed using different sort of poisons, and all of this would seem to be egging him on to commit murder. Freddie was completely aware this was a fantasy. She wrote this because letter writing, as she put it, was her way of talking to him. If it looked as if she was actually trying hard to get rid of the husband, he would be very pleased with this. It was clearly a level of fantasy. Of course, this was wonderful ammunition for the prosecution. Freddie was growing concerned, however. The intensity of her passion, he worried that it wasn't good for her and urged her to think less of him each day. Freddie's letters became less frequent, much to Edith's distress. But when Freddie returned from sea in September 1922, their passion for each other overwhelmed all other considerations. From the affair nearly ending, now their love was rekindled with a new intensity. It was a matter of days before Freddie was due back at sea. However, something was about to happen that would change the course of their lives and be discussed for decades to come. Frederick Bywater's emotions soon overtook him, and he was about to make a truly horrific decision that would be the cause of so many unnecessary deaths. 
the story of Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters would play out like a Shakespearean tragedy. Edith would find herself helpless in a system massively stacked against her. And yet in the same year, another infamous murder case involving a woman who had actually shot and killed her husband would see her stunningly acquitted and allowed to walk free. Edith would not be so lucky. Edith Thompson's marriage to her husband, Percy, had seemingly broken beyond repair. She was part of a new wave of women who had emerged at the end of the First World War, and her modern lifestyle seemed incompatible with the unadventurous and at times aggressive Percy. She had begun an affair with Frederick Bywaters, whom she'd known for many years, and who was still only a teenager. It soon developed into a passionate romance. But that intense love affair was about to have disastrous consequences when it became clearer to Freddy that the conventions of the era made it impossible for them to be together. The 3rd of October, 1922. London is cold and damp. Edith and Freddy meet for lunch. She feels guilty. She has plans for the evening she can't get out of. She has to go to the theatre with her husband, her aunt and uncle. Then she joins her husband and accompanies him to the Criterion where they watch a farce, The Dippers, and they all leave the theater at 10.45. As the party are making their separate ways, Freddy is leaving Edith's parents' house after dinner where he's been with some old friends. His imminent return to sea looms large in his mind. The reality of his situation is brought into sharper focus. Percy and Edith return from the theater to Ilford just before midnight. There was under a mile between the train station and their home. Percy dies on the street that night. A distraught, confused Edith is taken home. She barely seems to realize that her husband is dead. Freddie was about to go back to sea and he knew that they'd gone to theater and, and he'd had a drink or two and suddenly his jealousy and fury about Percy, I think, overtook him. And in the heat of the moment, he draws a knife he stabbed him a number of times and then ran away. It's late in the morning on the day after the attack when they come to Edith to take a statement. She lies to the police. She doesn't mention seeing Freddie or anyone else attack her husband. And shortly afterwards, she's taken to Ilford Police Station for further questioning. Tell me about the incident. We went to work as normal. We said we would meet at quarter to six. Where? At Aldersgate Street. We then met my aunt and uncle at the Criterion, the theater. Mm. This silly play was on. We left the theater at about 11, the, the four of us. We were all getting the tube from Piccadilly Circus. Percy and I went on to Liverpool Street and then we caught the 11.30 train to Ilford. It arrived about midnight. We then started walking home as normal. What route? Along York Road, then Belgrave. Mm. We had just got to between De Vere and Ensley Gardens. We were walking on the right-hand side. And then he... Percy went into the roadway. I went in after him. 
and he fell up against me. He was staggering, bleeding. From where? Where, where was the blood coming from? His mouth, I, I thought. Y you did not see anyone else? No other person was present? I can't remember seeing anyone. Uh, there certainly wasn't anyone when he fell up against me, I know that. I got hold of him with both hands and I helped him over to the wall. Uh, he stood for a minute or two and then he f slid down onto the footway. He never spoke. And where were you at this time? I fell down onto the ground with him. You, you did not shout out or scream or... You cannot remember? No. I see. The police knew that Percy's mutilated body told a completely different story. The attack on Belgrave Road had resulted in eight wounds to his side, another along his arm, with more cuts sliced on his chin and jaw. But it was the three deep wounds to his neck that were fatal. One penetrated the floor of Percy's mouth, another severed the carotid artery. It had been a frenzied, violent assault. Percy had been stabbed several times, and one of the wounds was a serious wound in his neck. Yeah. Edith ran for help to the neighbors. A doctor came, examined Percy, who was at that time in a, in a, a bad way. Help! Edith clearly had no idea this was going to happen. She was absolutely horrified. She was saying, oh, no, don't, don't, don't. You know, and people could hear this. Edith may have been trying to protect Freddie, or may have still been in complete shock over the incident. Whatever the reason, she was maintaining a version of events that simply could not have happened. I got up off the ground and I ran along to Cortland Avenue. I was going to call Dr. Maudsley, but I met this lady and gentleman uh, first. I told them to get a doctor that my husband was ill, something like that. Yeah. Words to that effect. The gentleman said he would go. Yeah. There was this whole crowd by the time the doctor arrived. He took so long. He had a look at Percy. And? And he told me he was dead. An ambulance came, mm. took him away. I didn't. They took me home. Two policemen, they took me. The press were crawling all over the streets of Ilford. Local newspapers, such as the Ilford Recorder, were soon joined by the Nationals. All sought out witnesses, family friends, acquaintances, anyone who would speak about the murdered man and the wife being held for questioning by the police. But it wasn't just the newspapers who were interested in the very personal details of Edith's life. The police knew they needed to find someone with a motive for the attack. Do you know a man named Frederick Bywaters? Yes. Yes, I've known him several years. We were at school together. Well, we weren't. I wasn't, I mean, but my brothers were. Freddy works on ships now. Freddy? He's away a lot at sea. Do you see him when he's home? At my parents. He visits my family. He's always done that. Oh. He was at school with my brothers. Yes, yes, you said. Mr. Bywaters was a, a lodger of you and your husband for a period last year, was he not? From the 18th of June. He came as a paying guest. Yes. He paid 25 shillings a week. I see. Well, he was with you from uh, June the 18th till the beginning of August, 1921. Yes. That August bank holiday, do you remember? Yes. That weekend, did anything happen? It was nothing. Well, you quarrelled with your husband, did you not? It was an argument, it was nothing. He did not throw you across the room? I knocked over a chair. He did not hit you? Freddie Bywaters rescued you, did he not? He intervened. Well, on your behalf. Why do you suppose he did that? 
I don't know. He was angry with Percy. He was trying to help. No, Percy was angry too. He told him to leave. I don't know. He kicked him out. It wasn't like that. Freddie and Percy were friends. No, Bywaters did leave though. Did he not? Yes. So something must have happened? It was just an argument. They were friends. Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters were much more than friends, though, as the police were starting to realize. With Inspector Wensley growing ever more suspicious, Edith wasn't helping herself by sticking to a clearly impossible explanation for the death of Percy Thompson. Events would soon spiral completely out of control for Edith, as the trial of the decade would soon hit the courts. On the 3rd of October, 1922, Edith and Percy Thompson had been returning home to Ilford from a night at the theatre in central London. Percy had not survived the journey home. Someone had violently assaulted him, and it clearly wasn't Edith. The police had caught up with Frederick Bywaters and brought him into the station. They were determined to find out more about the true nature of the relationship between Edith and Freddie. Edith maintained her story, but tongues had been wagging. People had realized that um, Edith was carrying on with Frederick Bywaters. Um, and Frederick was then arrested as a suspect. Freddie insisted he was innocent. He told police that on the night in question, he had dined with Edith's parents and then gone straight home to his mother's in South London. Forensics told the lie of his story. The simplest test revealed the stains on his coat to be blood. Freddie was detained. Police were employing new techniques to solve crime. Scotland Yard's fingerprint bureau had been inaugurated at the turn of the century. By the 1920s, under the leadership of Superintendent Charles Stockley Collins, its officers were refining and improving their techniques. The famous database of prints was growing year by year. But other forms of forensic science were emerging too. Frederick Brown and William Kennedy were hanged by microscope after ballistics analysis matched Brown's gun with bullets used in the shooting of a police officer. And another case in 1922 saw famed pathologist Bernard Spilsbury give the decisive evidence against Herbert Rouse Armstrong, who was subsequently convicted of poisoning his wife with arsenic. It was low cunning rather than science that secured the confessions in the Thompson case, however. The police, led by Inspector Francis Hall, were deeply manipulative. They misled Freddie and Edith about what the other had said, and even arranged an accidental meeting between the pair in a corridor of the police station to heighten their distress. They saw each other at the police station, and when Edith saw Frederick was also being arrested, um, she sort of became very emotional and then admitted that it was actually Frederick. It was when we got to near Ensley Gardens. A man rushed out and knocked me and pushed me away from Percy, and I hit my head. When I got my senses back, I saw Percy. He was scuffling with someone, a man. I knew it was Freddy. I didn't see his face, but I knew. I knew. He was wearing his blue overcoat, the gray hat he always wears. He was running. I didn't want him to do it. Once it was admitted by Edith that Frederick was the assailant, Frederick could no longer maintain this defense of it not being anything to do with him. So he then said that he had been approaching Percy, really saying to him, why don't you agree to a separation or a divorce so that um, Edith and I can be together because you know that's what's going to make her happy and you're being very unreasonable. Um, but he said then that Percy had threatened him with a gun and that he'd had this knife and he had to defend himself. Well, there was no gun found and that was fictitious. Um, so 
Even his second defense didn't really have any credibility. Freddie finally confessed to the murder. He insisted Edith knew nothing of his actions, but the police by now had recovered Edith's letters to him. Freddie had kept them all these years, and now they made a damning impression on investigators. At 8 p.m. on Thursday, the 5th of October, the lovers were charged with the murder of Percy Thompson. The trial of Freddie Bywaters and Edith Thompson began at the Old Bailey on the 6th of December, 1922. The case would capture the country's imagination, thanks in no small part to the passionate letters that Edith had sent to Freddie. Only a selection was submitted as evidence. Others were withheld, deemed too explicit for public consumption. These are addressed to Mr. F. Bywaters. Do you recognize them? Yes. Is that your handwriting? Yes. Did you usually exchange letters with Mr. Bywaters? It was a habit. It's an unusual one for a married woman. These letters are affectionate. Is that fair to say? Yes. And Mr. Bywaters replies, are they couched in similar terms? Where are those letters? I don't have them. You have not them hidden away somewhere? Because Freddie kept his. I burn them, but that is my custom. I see. I burn all my letters. I'm not hiding anything. That's my custom. Your husband knew then. He was aware of the correspondence. He consented? No. No. In the country, there had been great sympathy for the young lovers. Many were captivated by the elegantly dressed Edith and touched by Freddie's conduct. His only defense would have been to blame Edith, the older woman, for seducing and corrupting him, inciting him to murder. Throughout, However, Freddie stuck to his story. Edith had nothing to do with the crime. When he killed Percy, he acted alone. As the trial went on, though, it was his lover's reputation that soured. This is not just the letters, is it, Mrs. Thompson? No. You do not just see Freddie at your parents? No. The two of you, on occasion, meet when he is home. Is that right? Yes. Without your husband's knowledge? It was a habit. What's interesting about the press representation of Edith is before the letters have come up, there's a lot of quite positive portrayals of her. She's presented as very fashionably dressed. They talk about how she looks and how wonderful she is at dancing. They quote people saying, what a wonderful businesswoman. So there's a positive representation. Once the letters start to be quoted, it all shifts. I don't think she did have a chance. What we have here is the older woman seducing the younger man, the man just out of his teens. And I think that, that was the sort of shock reaction. The fact that she is a modern woman who dares to have sexual agency. I mean, I think this is part of her downfall. But Edith wasn't the only woman who found her character called into question by both the press and the justice system. 1923 was a year of highly dramatic cases involving women accused of murder. Not long after Edith Thompson went to court, the Madame Farmy case also grabbed the headlines, but this time with a completely different conclusion. The Madame Farmy case was um, quite a cause celebre in its day. But who she was and what her background was was a mystery. Nobody knew really much about her past until after the trial. It turned out quite the scandalous background to it. Marie was a French woman who had worked as a prostitute, and she married Ale Farmé, who was a millionaire Egyptian. And they came to London in 1923 and stayed in the Savoy Hotel. 
It was at the Savoy, during a huge thunderstorm, that the killing took place. Following a massive argument in front of other guests, Madame Farmy later shot and killed her husband with a pistol that he had given her for protection. When it went to court, she bought the leading defense lawyer of the time, Marshall Hall, who was a brilliant theatrical performer. He argued that Ali Farmy was about to pounce on her. Marshall Hall hunched himself over, put his hands out, twisted his face, he was like a demon. He got the gun in his hand and he advanced on the jury like this, you know, sort of, this is how Prince Farmy behaved. There was absolutely no evidence for this. The jury was sort of overwhelmed by this performance and Madame Farmy, to everyone's astonishment, was acquitted. It has been suggested that Madame Farmy once had a relationship with the Prince of Wales during World War I and was in possession of several letters from the prince, which would have been revealed if she'd been convicted. For that to have come out would have been kind of very detrimental to the royal family and you know, the upper classes generally. So she could well have had that, that hold. Madame Farmy may have been able to walk free from the courts after shooting her husband dead, but things did not go so smoothly for Edith Thompson, despite the fact that it was Frederick Bywaters who carried out the killing. Even the judge was against her. An old school moralist, he referred to Bywaters as the adulterer. And refusing to recognize that there were any women on the jury, referred to them as gentlemen throughout. The jury spent two hours deliberating most of this time was spent reading Edith's letters. The verdicts were returned. Guilty. They were both sentenced to death. The morning of the hanging, she was in a terrible state. She was very heavily drugged. She was virtually unconscious. They had to drag her along there. Clearly, it was very disturbing for those involved in doing it. I think it was probably one of those cases that led to people revising their opinion about the death penalty. On the 9th of January, 1923, both Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters were hanged. Crowds gathered around Holloway Prison to witness the execution of Edith. Edith's hangman, John Ellis, was utterly traumatized by her execution. He was convinced she would receive a last minute reprieve, but she didn't. He would commit suicide almost a decade later. The story of Edith Thompson is a tale of nothing but tragedy. <laughs>